Um, good morning, everyone. And first, uh, thanks to PSG for, <clears throat> for this kind invitation. And um, it's an honor to follow Professor. It's not easy to follow him after that amazing, uh, very crisp and clear presentation he made on primordial prevention. I think there is a connection between that and this because what I am going to talk about is something that um, probably needs to be addressed even before a woman gets uh, pregnant. But let me just show you the, um, what obesity can do to a pregnant woman uh, and to her offspring. So very quickly, um, a little bit about the, the rise of obesity in women, the NFHS data, uh, and health status of women of reproductive age in challenges with conception itself, uh, pregnancy outcomes, and what it does to offspring, and less about GDM and uh, uh, hypertensive disorders. These are all things we already know about, but what we know less about are things like uh, birth defects and uh, mental health issues and other challenges. I'll, I'll go in detail about that, possibly what we, sh we need to do about that. So um, I would strongly recommend this um, article by Professor Krianga and uh, uh, Pat Catalano on obesity in pregnancy, which goes in great detail. And what they start by saying is, it's the most common health problem in women of reproductive age. Okay, so I, I just threw some numbers there, and 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 just for uh, to explain this, 25 million are the number of births in India per year. Not the number of pregnant women per year, number of births per year. And on a given year, there are about anywhere from 40 to 50 million women who are pregnant. But 25 million babies are born. 24% is, I will show you, NFHS data saying women of reproductive age who are obese. Because I learned that the NFHS actually is looking at women between the ages of 15 and 49. I thought they are looking at everyone. And then I found out they're only looking at 15 to 49. And mostly women and a small number of men. So in essence, all the NFHS data we are getting is women of reproductive age. So 24%, which means one out of four women in reproductive age is, is obese. 332 million are the number of women in reproductive age in India alone. So just imagine the, the scope of this problem. So just incredible amount of, uh, in a numbers, what we are talking about. And one in four or one in six are the number of people uh, who are developing hyperglycemia in pregnancy, whether you're looking at the IDF atlas or you're looking at data. So this is the NFHS data I wanted to show, um, you know, comparing NFHS 4 and 5. And for women, it is 24. And they are using 25 as the cutoff for defining obesity. They are not even looking at overweight, which is 23 for Indian women. And if they included that, probably this number would be much higher. So it's 24%. And this is a for forecasting the prevalence of overweight and obesity in India um, up to 2040. You can see all those top lines are the numbers that are, these are by, you know, um, uh, by five years. And you can see by 2040, 2040, we are going to have both urban and rural, overweight and obese, phenomenal increases um, in, in women. Now, why are Indian women gaining so much weight? It could be anything from their leisure time activity, which is something like this, hours and hours of um, sedentary television watching, or it could be, um, you know, there's plenty of all kinds of food available. And I chose this picture because, as you can see, if the mother is overweight and this is the kind of food they're eating, the child is also overweight. So it's a generational kind of uh, thing that is happening. And also there are other emotional, socio-cultural aspects to women gaining weight. And, and as you can see from this, there is depression, there is loneliness, not being allowed to go outside. So they may resort to food as a form of solace. 
And then this is very important. This is the gestational weight gain and the retention of gestational weight gain because with each pregnancy, as the gestational weight gain is retained, greater BMI, greater fat mass, and greater visceral fat, and therefore greater risk for GDM and uh, hypertensive complications and later life diabetes and hypertension. So a very simple understanding of obesity has been, you know, calories in, calories out, which was the old narrative. You ate more, you spent less, and therefore you gained weight. But the new narrative is something like this. Yes, there, is, there may be genetic susceptibility and inheritance of the, in, the resting metabolic rate. But more importantly, so many other things, as you can see, um, from emotional stress to sleep deprivation to eating disorders, endocrine disruptors, um, and then epigenetic modifications, medications, so many things. This is women in general, but if you take women of reproductive age, sedentary lifestyle, unhealthy eating habits, stress, these are all major factors for weight gain. We usually associate obesity with these kind of complications, the ones on the left, and also some malignancies that have been associated with um, obesity. But what we are going to talk about is this which is what does obesity do to pregnant women? So everything from suffering miscarriages to, um, I mean, gestational diabetes, which we know, hypertensive disorders, depression, preterm birth, uh, labor complications, and cesare increased cesarean section. And you might wonder, so what if they have a cesarean section? We now know the complications from that, including altering gut microbiomes and how that impacts the next generation, they are at greater risk for obesity. And then in the long-term challenges for the mother herself are many, but I will talk in detail about what also happens to the offspring in terms of including congenital malformations. So in this data, which is again from Pat Catalano's study, you can see what happens with maternal obesity, everything from miscarriage to GDM to preeclampsia to antepartum depression and anxiety, which can be either from um, uh, body shaming to uh, body image to actually um, uh, a, a neurochemical um, depression as well, from macrosomia large for gestational age, still births are higher in women who are obese, congenital heart defects more than um, spina bifida or other conditions, though spina bifida is also uh, you know, common, preterm births, and you can see postpartum depression. Difficulty with breastfeeding is also more common in women who are overweight. But what about Indian women? Maternal obesity and pregnancy outcomes in perspective of new Asian, this is from the new Asian Indian guidelines, and they have used a BMI of 25. So which is good, because the earlier one I showed you used a BMI of 30. So when they've used a BMI of 25, also you can see between the non-obese and the obese, very high risk of all the complications that I've been talking about. So it is relevant for our country, it is relevant for people with a BMI of 25, so it's extremely relevant that we need to address this. These complications are higher. So how does obesity actually cause many of these things? A very simple thing would be, okay, obesity increases the risk of systemic inflammation. And when there is maternal inflammation, there is also placental macrophage infiltration and um, pro-inflammatory cytokine production. The fetus is exposed to all these pro-inflammatory cytokines, more glucose, more lipids, more oxidative stress. So we, you can understand. But then if you drill down further, you can see from the, from the oocyte stage, from the blastocyte stage, you can have genome-wide DNA methylation which will lead to epigenetic changes and programming. As Sir has repeatedly showed us Barker's, um, you know, the Barker hypothesis, how the womb is more important, right from the beginning, from the blastocyst stage, oocyte stage. And then the next, in, in placental changes, where there are all kinds of um, epigenetic changes there as well, and then um, the offspring neonatal programming that happens. So this is how it happens right at the beginning and why it is so important. Eight to 10 weeks is very, very important. 
even that may be a little bit late, we may actually have to really focus on the preconception period. So why is preconception important? Because if you look here in low income countries and middle income countries, as much as 93% in low income countries, 67% in middle income countries, pregnancies are unintended pregnancies or unplanned pregnancies. Even the ones that are intended, the mothers don't have a proper pre-pregnancy care or pre-pregnancy planning. So that's something to keep in mind as well. And we know about the big babies and the, sometimes you can also have small babies if the mother is obese. That's something to keep in mind also. But what we have to remember is that the, regu the real birth defects like spina bifida and cardiovascular um, birth defects are becoming increasing in women who are obese. And so just to show you some data, congenital anomalies in obese versus non-obese gravida, everything from neural tube defects to cardiovascular anomalies, anorectal atresia, many of these are much more common in, in um, children, babies born to mothers who are obese. So if, if you want to look at a, a, a snapshot of what could happen to the, to the, to the infant, not only is there placental intrauterine environment where all these cytokines like um, IL-1 and uh, tumor necrosis factor, IL-6 and CRP goes up, lipotoxicity, oxidative stress, overactivation of the placental macrophages, fetal epigenetics, which I've already shown you. There's also, um, you know, in the breast milk, increase in IL-6 and decrease in neuroprotective factors. I already mentioned the fetal microbiome being changed, but very important, and I want to stress on is the association that we are now seeing between maternal obesity and baby's neurodevelopment. Autism and autism spectrum disorders are increasing in babies of mothers born who are obese. So this could be everything from impaired serotonin signaling, impaired dopaminergic signaling, and lipid buildup, so many um, you know mechanisms how um, this um, impaired um, uh, neurocognitive development is happening in the baby now what about pregnancy losses in mothers who are obese as you can see not in cat we, the moment we see these data from the west we think oh those mothers have bmis of 30, 40 and 50 not true i'm showing you data of mothers maternal bmis that are 20 25 and 30 and I show you the increase in everything from fetal death to stillbirths to perinatal death neonatal death and infant death all of this increased in babies of mothers who have increase in weight uh, what about gestational diabetes clearly increased risk of GDM multiple risk factors for GDM obesity is a very very big one for the rise in GDM. And then you can link all the complications of GDM also to mothers who are overweight. Now, so um, during the pregnancy, I've mentioned these already, there's also other things, cardiac dysfunction, sleep apnea, proteinuria, NAFLD, carpal tunnel syndrome, um, pregnancy, oh, well, what is pregnancy-associated pregnancy? Pregnancy-associated pregnancy hypertension, post-term pregnancy, multi-fetal pregnancy. And intrapartum, they can have induction of labor, C-section delivery, um, a failed trial of labor, uh, endometritis, wound dehiscence, and venous thromboembolism. Why this venous thromboembolism has to be kept in mind is it can be prevented if we preemptively and proactively use agents to decrease the complications of venous thromboembolism and many postpartum complications as well, including postpartum depression, infection, again, venous thromboembolism and difficulty with breastfeeding. But as an endocrinologist and physician who sees these patients long term, I want to show you what happens if a mother either has GDM or gestational hypertension, preterm labor, low birth weight, high birth weight, all of those things is they, those mothers are at greater risk for future cardiovascular disease. So there's looking at pregnancy as a window to future chronic disease. That concept has to come into our radar. Pregnancy should not be looked as this myopic, 
short term, as soon as the baby is out, out of sight, out of mind. Everybody is happy. Patient is happy, family is happy, the OBGYN is happy, the diabetologist is happy, and then the woman is out of our sight. That cannot happen because the next pregnancy, postpartum care is actually preconception care. It's care for the next pregnancy, and it's also care lifelong. So very important that we don't let these women out of our sight. And as Sir said, GDM is the mother of all NCDs. So if you want NCD prevention, we need to keep them, you know, and, and not enough that we just uh, prevent GDM in this pregnancy or if we took care of that, but actually, um, you know, took care of them for the long term. And as you can see from here, mothers who have GDM versus mothers who didn't, you look at the CV risk factors um, like hypertension or dyslipidemia, uh, much higher in women who have had gestational diabetes in the long run. This is following them up for years, okay? So, uh, brings me to how do we fix this? We have talked about all bad things happening to mothers who are overweight. Um, I love this cartoon because, I mean, we're trying, but I don't think we're going about it the right way, unfortunately. So how do we do this? So there is a roadmap for that. An excellent roadmap, which is why I quoted Pat Catalano's study right at the beginning. So they're saying, before conception, you discuss subfertility and other obesity associated risks with the woman. Recommend lifestyle and weight loss interventions. Assess need for treatment of or treat presenting conditions. Refer to specialist if needed. Provide folic acid supplementation, all of those things. But what is important is to have that conversation because we, I think, are walking um, very politically correct or we are very afraid. We call it medicalizing a pregnancy. Please be my guest, medicalize it. You know, I know this is a radical thing I'm saying. Um, when we say med do not medicalize pregnancy, you'll make the mother very anxious or the woman, it should be a wonderful uh, journey into motherhood and she should be happy and not worried about what happens. But if a mother, if a young woman knows that if her being overweight could increase the risk of autism or autism spectrum disorders or complications for her baby, I, I know, I, I speak for every woman. They will be more than happy to change their lifestyle and get on to a healthy trajectory if, because they want a healthy baby also. They don't want just a baby. So it's really important that we empower them with the knowledge, but in the right language. Use the right words, non-threatening manner. Um, you know, we, you, we have to give them that information. And during pregnancy, Everybody's BMI should be calculated. That never happens. Discuss actual and appropriate weight gain. We don't do that also. Counsel on nutritional and exercise needs and screen for hypertension, proteinuria, type 2 diabetes, GDM, depression, obstructive sleep apnea, substance abuse, all of those things. Recommend ultrasound for dating right at the beginning. And ultrasounds are difficult in women who are obese anatomical survey and fetal growth. And as you can see, throughout the pregnancy and also post, I mean, after delivery, maintaining a high suspicion for complications, offer breastfeeding support early, counsel on risks associated with obesity for mother and newborn, counsel on family planning options, recommend lifestyle. So, which all brings us back, circles all back to preconception care, and I'll tell you why. If you initiate any treatment during pregnancy, it doesn't work, except in GDM, except in prevention of GDM. I'm talking about prevention of um, any kind of long-term complications. The horse is out of the barn. You can't lock the door again. So if you want to stop that horse from bolting the barn, you, you really have to do it before time. And this study has very clearly showed that any kind of dietary behavior change or lifestyle modification that you initiate afterwards, um, too little, too late. So you'll have to do this now. So why the need for preconception care? Most pregnancies are unplanned. Women enter the pregnancies these days heavier, 
with more nutritional deficiencies, metabolic problems, there's environmental pollution, which also increases the risk of obesity, unhealthy behaviors, and greater mental stress. And as Sir showed, the first eight weeks are critical for organogenesis, and the window starts closing even before most of them come for their first antenatal visit. Interventions after the start of pregnancy have not yielded the required results. So the developmental origin of adult disease has its origins in maternal health, actually. And pregnancy is a window to future chronic disease. So it's for all these reasons that we have to follow these. Uh, we only have this, unfortunately, the IOM guidelines. Um, I'll ask Piki later if we, we, this has been modified and if we can do anything. Of course, we use the Asian guidelines for classifying the obesity in women, but in terms of how much weight they should gain and how much per trimester and things like that, we're still, most people are following IOM guidelines. So my last two slides, I mean, uh, last couple of slides, I just want to say, if we intervene early, you, this is a, a beautiful slide which will show you, and, and Sashank mentioned plasticity. In the early time, fetal life, there is high plasticity. If we intervene then, you can actually bring it below the threshold for disease. If you intervene later, you know, you can't do much about it. So this is a great window of opportunity. So the solutions are increase awareness. Awareness, awareness, awareness. More education about gestational diabetes, diabetes, and also about obesity. Good preconception care. Prevention of obesity through school and college-based programs. Po policy changes. And a life course approach than a myopic and narrow view of women's health. Activism and advocacy. Co cohesiveness and collaboration across. And, the, and FIGO has got a prevention of NCD by interventions in the preconception period position paper, also helpful with good tips. Very important for frontline health workers and um, office staff to uh, actually counsel women before they get pregnant and in early pregnancy about do's and don'ts, nutrition, physical activity, because women are battling two things. On the one hand, mothers, grandmothers, aunts, everybody around them telling them about pregnancies from 50, 100 years ago and us telling them what they need to do they're conflicted a lot. So in this program, it's actually a clinic support program. Um, you can see here, it's, it's, it's strategies for a community health visitor, person, you know, health worker, who can facilitate group discussions, peer support and success for healthy food and activity, and, and physicians can, of course, reinforce it. But it has to be done by community health workers. It can be done by them. So. I know this is a bit controversial. Um, we have to stop admiring pathology. We have enough evidence on everything already, most of the things, and start doing something. So there is a new science now called implementation science. Moving from evidence to implementation is 2024. So we have to start treating the whole thing. So keeping with that, we are launching this program called Yuvadi. Shalini knows about that. And this is, Yuvadi means young woman in Tamil also. And it also means, and it's also an acronym for this. It's a young woman awareness of diabetes and health initiative. So in North and South, it will be Yuvadi. And it's a program that we are launching to educate women about um, healthy eating, uh, good lifestyle, prevention of obesity, prevention of GDM, prevention of diabetes. Thank you so much.